Well, good morning and welcome to Axiom Medical's first fast track to OSHA COVID compliance. And this is our virtual summit this morning. We thank you for joining us. My name is Holly Foxworth. I am a registered nurse. I'm the webinar host and also the marketing man for content here at Axiom. And I'm really excited to bring you such a dynamic event. Um, this morning. So it's going to go through until two this afternoon, but we have a wide range of topics um, along with industry experts that are going to be able to get you some great information specific to uh, the new changes and mandates by OSHA. So we will have a total of eight sessions today, and those will each be 30 minutes long. Um, and so should you encounter any issues, technical issues, um, please remember that what the uh, the console that you're looking at at the bottom, you should see several different buttons there. There will be one that has a question mark. And so you can simply select that, type in whatever your, your question is there. Um, however, we are going to change things up a little bit from our traditional webinar format whenever it comes to the question and answer session. You'll notice that at the top of your screen there, there should be a box that says breakout room. And so if you would like to speak with an Axiom representative at any point during the uh, session today, simply click, uh, press that join button and that'll get you in there and you guys can communicate back and forth directly. We will also have our speakers that will be joining the Q&A session and that will be immediately following the conclusion of their presentation. So they will be available they'll take your questions you can ask them directly we have cameras you'll see them and and so it'll really kind of give you that one-on-one -on -one experience even if you don't have any questions yourself but you just want to ask um, and listen to some of the questions that are going to be asked by others so i think that that is the majority of the things i wanted to mention early on um, the final thing though is is just in regards to how it is that you're going to be able to navigate um, between the multiple sessions that we have going on here today so at the conclusion um, just remember that you'll log out um, and you would need that access link to register for the, the following session that's going to be coming up. So in the event that you have not already registered, there will be a prompt that will show up on your screen and it'll have the session on there. There's a button that says register now. You can simply select that. It will give you a access code and then we will look for you then in the next session to join us. So I think that from my perspective, I think that should kind of sum things up, uh, but I would like to introduce you though to um, our first speaker. We're going to be delivering the keynote address. This is Dr. David Michaels. He's an epidemiologist. He's a public speaker, professor at George Washington University, and he's also been the Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA, um, and he, is, he has some amazing information that he's going to be able to share with you today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Michaels, to introduce yourself, and we will get going. Uh, thank you, Holly. I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, I know that you have a lot of questions. We'll have some time for that later. So as you heard, I ran the Occupational Safety and Health Administration for seven years under President Obama. Um, I'm the longest serving head of OSHA. I used to actually, um, under President Clinton, I was actually Assistant Secretary of Energy. I was in charge of protecting workers and the public around the nation's nuclear weapons complex. Um, and the last couple of years, last year and a half, I've really been focused on COVID. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is what we know and what we don't know about the um, upcoming emergency temporary standard that OSHA is going to put out, I think probably next week. Uh, which is going to require large employers, employers with more than 100 employees, uh, to either uh, make sure their workers are vaccinated or tested. Um, it's one of a suite of new regulations that the federal government is putting out or about to. It's the only one actually without a firm vaccination requirement. So two regulations have been released already. Uh, one saying all federal workers have to be vaccinated and the other that workers at federal contractors in certain uh, jobs will have to be vaccinated. And we can come back to that later if you want. But two more are coming out, I think, next week, as I said, one by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, saying that, that healthcare workers have to be vaccinated, and the OSHA standard. Now, of course, we don't know exactly what's in the emergency temporary standard that OSHA is putting out because it could be changed up to the last minute. Right now, there are meetings going on where stakeholders are at the White House saying this is what they'd like to see, what they don't want to see, et cetera. Um, but we know more or less um, what the, the general contours are. So I can talk about that. Um, based on my understanding of what OSHA can do, 
what it can't do, and also what other agencies are doing. And the reason that's important is the federal government wants harmonization. The contractor rule, for example, says that if you're an employer, you can't just take your employee's word for it that they've been vaccinated. You have to have digital proof, and that's going to be, I assume, in the OSHA rule as well. So the basis of how OSHA works is the OSHA law, which is now 50, 51 years old, which says that employers have the responsibility, have the legal obligation to provide a workplace free of recognized serious hazards. It's interesting, OSHA has no jurisdiction over workers. It only has jurisdiction over employers. And that's what's gonna be um, applied here with the basic idea that OSHA's job is to tell employers to make sure the hazards are out of the workplace. Of course, the hazard for COVID-19 is not simply the virus that's in the air, but it's the infectious worker who brings the virus into the workplace or other sort of setting. So to the hazard in some ways to think about is that worker. And so the OSHA regulation will say to employers, you have to make sure that when workers come into your workplace, they're not infectious. And OSHA is gonna treat this, I think, primarily as a record keeping regulation in that uh, inspectors will um, expect to see how you keep track of these requirements. So the requirements are pretty straightforward. Uh, Worker is fully vaccinated, which means they're two weeks past their final shot, either uh, M uh, an mRNA vaccine, uh, the second dose, or probably the first dose of J&J, though that may change now and have to be a second dose of J&J, we'll see. Um, but two weeks after that, and that you have to keep track of that. And if someone is not vaccinated, you have to keep track of their testing and they have to be tested every week. Um, now, once the rule goes into effect, you're gonna have to give workers time off to get vaccinated and time off to recover. How much time? I suspect OSHA will say something like a reasonable amount of time. I don't think they'll tell you how much. And, but they're gonna leave it up to you, but you'll have to have a program that says, this is what we are offering. It's worth noting that right now, if you um, require vaccination or if you encourage vaccination, you actually do not legally have to give time off uh, for either for either the vaccination or for recovery. Though, obviously, I think you'll likely get better pickup if you do. Um, now, the testing is the much bigger question. Um, and we don't know, my guess is uh, OSHA is gonna allow antigen testing and not actually a, a PCR test, which is more expensive and takes longer. Um, but they're gonna, what they're wrestling with now when they're coordinating with CDC, I'm sure, are these questions like, what's the proof of, that, of testing? Um, how do you know a worker has been tested negative? It has to be a negative test within the last two weeks. And of course, who pays for that test our workers given time off to take the test. Um, I suspect that you will be asked to pay for the test. Um, why? Well, uh, I think there are equity issues for certainly for low wage workers to ask them to find the test, which is difficult, um, and to get get tested um, is is burdensome on them. And I think the government would prefer to put this on the medium sized and large employers who are. Uh, covered by this rule. Of course, th this rule, as many of you probably know, does not cover small employers or employers with 100, uh, less than 100 workers. But larger employers, I think, will probably be told you have to pay for the testing to keep track of it. Um, the reason for that, in some ways, is unsaid, but the philosophy behind all of these government efforts are, are to increase the vaccination rate. I think the White House and, and the government in general, the public health community understands that the most effective way we're gonna control this pandemic is by increasing vaccination rates. So while testing is useful, it doesn't increase vaccination rates. It doesn't really slow down the pandemic as much as we'd like. And so I believe that if um, employers are told you can vaccinate or you can test, but you'll have to pay for the test and you'll have to go through all sorts of um, requirements to keep track of that, it will be much easier for employers to say, well, we're just going to require all of our employees to be vaccinated. Of course, there are uh, medical exceptions and religious exceptions, and we can get to them now or, or in the questions. But in general, I think the, the uh, general approach is trying to say, look, get your people vaccinated. 
And some businesses have already announced mandatory vaccination policies, and you've read about that, and they've, they've been very successful. United Airlines has reached a 99% compliance rate with their vaccination requirement. Now, the headlines were that uh, United had to let go 600 employees. That sounds like a lot to some people, but you know, United has 67,000 employees, so it's less than 1%. It's, it's really you know, not outside normal turnover. Um, other employers are negotiating with their unions. Um, the most well-known example of that is Tyson's, and that's a very different workforce than United. United has pilots and flight attendants, um, maintenance people who are highly skilled, uh, folks who work behind counters at, at airports, where Tyson's is a large meat, you know, beef, pork, and chicken producer. They have workers who are uh, less educated. They do a blue-collar job. Um, large number of immigrant workers, uh, minority workers, some skepticism of the government. Um, what Tyson did was they negotiated with the food and commercial workers so additional sick time and some vacation time uh, in exchange for com compulsory vaccinations, and they're up to 96% have gotten vaccinated. So they won't have to worry very much about this OSHA rule because all their people are vaccinated. So one question I often get about the OSHA uh, rule and all OSHA rules is, how will it be enforced? And you know, for the most part, OSHA regulations are self-enforced. Employers, businesses like all the ones you work for have HR departments, they have attorneys, they have safety offices. And when they learn about a new regulation, whether it's from OSHA or any other government agency, the first question is not how will they enforce it, but how will we comply? Because you're law abiding. Whatever the, the law is, you, you want to follow it. You may not like all the requirements of law, but you're, you understand that it's your job to follow the law. So for the most part, this regulation will be self-enforced. You will do what the government says, of course, and that's what we're going to discuss, how you, how you get there. But OSHA also will do inspections, and OSHA and its state partners have about 2,000 inspectors, and then there are other inspectors in the Labor Department who can follow up on this as well. And so when they do random inspections in a construction site or a factory or a warehouse, they will say right now, um, or once this goes into effect, let me see your records. How are you keeping track of who's vaccinated and who is tested for people who are on site? Now, if you have workers who are working from their home, my guess is they don't have to be vaccinated or tested. But if you want them to come in and they come in contact with other workers, uh, they have to be vaccinated or tested. And you've got to keep track of that. And so just as an OSHA inspector comes in and says, let me see your OSHA log. Let me see your injury and illness um, records. Let me see your hazard communication program. They will say, let me see your uh, vaccination testing program. So that will be some inspections. In addition, uh, workers will complain. There'll be workers who, for whatever reason, don't believe that you're doing the right thing, and they will call OSHA, and OSHA will follow up. Most likely, I believe, with a phone call or an email, and again, you'll have to provide your records. Um, there'll be some interesting challenges for OSHA to figure out. Um, this regulation says employers with 100 or more employees will be covered. That's different than OSHA usually works. OSHA usually works by the establishment for each workplace is treated as a unit. But this says 100 or more workers across state lines, perhaps, uh, in the whole country. Um, and of course, many of you know that OSHA has um, a system of state plans. It's sort of a mosaic. There are 21 states plus Puerto Rico that have their own state plans. They're overseen by OSHA, and by law, they have to be at least as effective as OSHA, but they have their own regulations. And so when OSHA issues this regulation, um, it will tell state plans, you have a certain amount of time, it could be a week, it could be a month, but it'll be pretty fast. You have to adopt a regulation at least as strong, at least as protective as the one OSHA put out. And so some states will do that quickly, California, Oregon, Washington, they will just do this as fast as they possibly can. Other states will take their time. Some states like, um, I believe South Carolina has already said, they're not gonna do this. And OSHA has made very clear to, to those states that they could come in and they could actually take over the state program if, if they don't do this. So I think they, they may. Um, I, it's, a, it's an interesting threat. It's a threat that OSHA has made before, has never had to follow through, but it could happen in this case. 
So um, that, that's the, the basic framework. Um, we could talk a little bit about uh, in questions about some of the exemption issues and things like that. But that's the basic information that you have to know. And what I've, I've learned from a lot of employers, and this is true of all the OSHA standards, um, when you see an OSHA standard coming, you're doing what you're you're doing today you're trying to figure out what do you need to do even before the standard comes out and you start that process because you know you're gonna have to do it so you might as well start doing it now um so i'm looking forward to your questions and um uh let's let's move over to the breakout group group oh, i love it great job that was excellent information dr michaels you did a fantastic job. Um, just to kind of sum things up and, and give you an idea of where we go from here, um, we do have the breakout rooms that are there. And so you will be able to um, interact directly with Dr. Michaels um, if you have some additional questions and he will take those. We also have, I believe, some Axiom representatives in there as well. Um, so if you'll click on that button, it's there on the right-hand side of your screen at the very top and that'll take you directly to the breakout room just as a reminder we also have the additional sessions that are going to be coming up if you have not registered for those yet please remember that that whenever you close out this particular screen there'll be a, a prompt that comes up that says what the next session will be and which that actually is going to be um, um, specific to legal and hr implications that are associated with uh with the mandate here and that is going to be hosted by axiom's um, chief legal and hr officer chuck cable so he's going to do a great job as well again thank you dr michaels i look forward to, to seeing all the questions that are going to be asked there in the breakout rooms and then we will see you guys at the next session thank you